We're going to talk about understanding of having a, w a biblical worldview. And the first few weeks will maybe kind of lay the foundation for what helps us to have a biblical worldview. And then in the weeks after that, we'll, we'll get into some things that are kind of topics uh, in our culture that we're living in today. Uh, we'll, we'll maybe talk about uh, some things like social justice. We'll maybe talk about some things like uh, the sanctity of life and abortion. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about some things that are important topics of what's kind of going on in our world today and try to also make sure that we as Christians have a biblical framework framework for all that we believe because the world around us is trying to inundate us with with their ideology their theology and we've got to make sure that our theology is based on the Bible we need to know what is right and true based on what God says is right and true so we're going to look at some important topics in the coming weeks and I think it'll be important and helpful uh, to us so let's go, go here if we can to the book of Titus and uh, we'll, we'll go here to Titus chapter number three Titus chapter number three I hope the lessons in the book of Titus have been helpful to you. I, they were helpful to me, and I thought they were important to uh, share in our church. And uh, I hope that they've taught you some things and challenged you about being what we ought to be as, as men and, and women, whether we're aged men, aged women, or young men, young women, even teenagers. Because teenagers, may I say, you are, you are young men and young ladies. Teenagers, not just some time in between childhood and adult where you it's 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 years to waste of your life now when Jesus was 12 years old he was he was uh, teaching in, in a temple he was he was a wise young man and we're not in the goal of just trying to raise teenagers to be teenagers and by that I mean raising ones that think you know this period of my life is all about you know goofing off and having fun and and being immature no we're trying to raise mature young men and mature young ladies and I believe biblically and as Christians, we ought to be doing that. And parents, you be raising your children to a point of maturity, to a point of maturity. Not that they don't enjoy their teen years. And, and I can preach about that. And I have um, in the past. But but boy, they ought to be developing within them a, a sober mindedness to love the Lord and serve the Lord and to be developing maturity in their life. And so that's certainly our desire uh, for for young people. We want to just come here today to Titus chapter 3 and try to finish out uh, this book of the Bible and some, some thoughts and lessons. Um, we won't cover each verse maybe as much as we did in previous weeks, uh, but we want to learn something this morning from God. Let's stand together if we can and let's read these scriptures. We'll look at Titus chapter 3. Let's stand together and let's, let's read it responsively. So I'll read verse 1 and then you'll all read verse 2 with me and we'll go back and forth like that, okay? Here we go. Titus chapter 3. Put them in mind to be subject to principalities and powers, to obey magistrates, to be ready to every good work, to speak evil of no man, to be no brawlers, but gentle, showing all meekness unto all men. For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving divers lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. But after that, the kindness and love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy He saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost, which He shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior that being justified by his grace we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life this is a faithful saying and these things I will that thou affirm constantly that they which have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works these things are good and profitable unto men but avoid foolish questions and genealogies and contentions and 
and striving about the law, for they are unprofitable and vain. A man that is an heretic after the first and second admonition reject, knowing that he that is such is subverted and sinneth, uh, being condemned of himself. When I shall send Artemis unto thee, or Tychicus, be diligent to come unto me to Nicopolis, for I have determined there to winter. Bring Zenus the lawyer and Apollos on their journey diligently, that nothing be wanting unto them. And let ours also learn to maintain good works for necessary uses, that they be not unfruitful. All that are with me salute thee. Greet them that love us in the faith. Grace be with you all. Amen. Let's pray together. And can you ask God to teach you something? Ask God to speak to your heart this morning, okay? Father, thank you so much for the privilege we have to be in church. Uh, Lord, I thank you for the song we heard the teenagers sing, Lord. Thank you for the song the choir sang. And Lord, may it be the desire of our heart to go back to Bethel. If we've maybe been away from you, Lord, may we realize that we can run back to you and you long to, to meet us. You, you long for us to be in your presence. You long for us to know uh, joyfulness and fruitfulness and blessing in our Christian life. And God, help us to return unto you. If it means we need to return to a place of prayer on a faithful daily basis. If we need to return to the Bible and get back in the Word of God and spend time reading it and meditating on every Every day, Lord, help us to do that. If it means we need to commit ourselves to faithfully coming back to the house of God and the church of God and being faithful to Bible study and prayer meetings and so on, Lord, help us to give uh, the local church a place of priority in our life. Lord, whatever it is that we may need to come back to you, help us to do it and live consecrated, dedicated lives for you that are glorifying to you. Teach us something from these verses this morning. Speak to our hearts, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. Thank you so much for standing and reading those scriptures with me. Titus chapter 3, it continues the thoughts uh, of Titus chapter 2. You know, obviously when the scriptures were written, it was really just one letter that Paul wrote to Titus. Uh, when people uh, gave us the Bible like we have it today, they, they just put chapters in there and verses in there to help us as, as churches and as congregations and so on to be able to navigate the Bible and read the Bible and know to look for a certain place and be able to read it together and study it together. But Titus chapter 3 is just continuing the thoughts of uh, chapter 2. And Paul begins by reminding Titus or telling Titus that he is to remind the people to be subject to or in submission to principalities and powers to obey magistrates. Let me just say that we should, we should always be seeking to submit to earthly authorities unless doing so goes against our higher authority, God in heaven. Should we, should we be following the rules of a land, the laws of a nation? Yes, we should be striving to obey the laws of a nation or the rules of a land and so on. We should be doing those things because that would be honoring and pleasing to God. But we do so up to a point until they tell us to do something that would go against something that our higher authority tells us we must do or cannot do. Do you understand what I'm saying? If the, if the government of the land, the government of the nation was to tell us, you can no longer preach the Bible. Well, am I to preach the Bible? Yes, I am. If, if the law of our nation says you can no longer speak, you can no longer read what the Bible says, you can no longer uh, share opinions from the scriptures because that would go against people. I'm to obey God. Uh, we're living in a scary time, in a scary nation. We, we think it's a free nation, but boy, there are people now trying to write into legislature things that would try to make it be illegal for us to, to read certain things in the scriptures because they might offend somebody. Uh, to, to, not in, to, to read them, to speak about them, anything, because it might go against somebody. It's a sad day we're living in. And all how we need to just rise up and realize that our obligation responsibility is always to our highest authority. It's always to God. You know, some back during the days of COVID, of course, some churches were getting in trouble because, you know, they were meeting in gigantic people with, sorry, gigantic buildings with a certain number of people and space to park. But the government said, wait a minute, you've got more than 50 people in that building. 
And so, so they come and they do different things and they, they come into churches and they try to follow the dictates and orders of people that are saying, you can no longer meet for church. You can no longer do this. They do all kinds of things. They send out police helicopters. They try to hunt people down to find out where these, you know, dangerous um, uh, rebel um, uh, uh, Christians are, you know, meeting in fields or hiding out in forests and looking for them. And where are, where are they meeting? Because what they're doing is so dangerous and rebellious and goes against the nation or so they would say. We're living in crazy times. Listen, if the, word of, if the government is ever going to tell you you can't do something that the Bible clearly tells you you're supposed to do, you need to follow God. And I need to follow God. But up until that point, are we to obey magistrates and follow the laws of a nation? Are we to, to be honest and pay our taxes and so on? Yes, we are. Right? We're to give honor to whom honor is due. And so it tells us to be subject to principalities and powers, to obey magistrates and so on. The, the reason for us being submissive to our boss at work, the reason for us being submissive and trying to live at peace with our authorities is so that we're a godly testimony to the world. And we're to do that up until the point that they try to tell us to do something that would go against our higher authority, God in heaven. I want you to notice another thing that it said there, though, at the end of verse 1. He says, you, you put them in mind, put the people in mind. They're on the island of Creed and the, the people in the churches there. Put them in mind, it says at the end of the verse, to be ready to every good work. To be ready... To do or to accomplish, right, every good work, the good things that the Lord would have you to do. Good works is a theme in this letter to Titus. In chapter 2 and verse uh, number 7, it says, In all things, showing thyself a pattern of good works. In doctrine, showing uncorruptness, gravity, sincerity. So in all things, showing thyself a pattern of good works. In chapter 2, verse 14, it says, Who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity, and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of, what's the next two words? Good works. Good works. There's a theme. God is, wants us to be concerned with doing good works. There are things that God has made us to do, things that God has want, uh, wants us to do. He wants us to be interested in doing good works. Look at chapter 3 and verse 1. And you help me, okay? Look at your Bible. Chapter 3, verse 1. Put them in mind to be subject to principalities, powers, to obey magistrates, to be ready to what? Every good work. Look at chapter 3 and verse number 8. Chapter 3 and verse 8. This is a faithful saying, and these things I will that thou affirm constantly, that they which have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works. Good works. You see that there in verse 8. And then go down to verse number 14. Chapter 3. Titus 3 verse 14. And let ours also learn to maintain good works. Good works. Five times just in those two chapters, he tells us to be mindful of maintaining and doing good works. God's plan is that these good works would characterize His people. Serving as a testimony to the world that our faith is real. That our faith is real. Now, now do we do works to earn our way to heaven? No. Salvation is completely by God's grace and mercy. We're not saved by our works. But we're to be careful to maintain good works. We're to be purposeful about doing good works. We're to be mindful of maintaining and doing good works and so on. Why? Because that ought to be the character of us as a Christian. That, that can become our testimony to the world of who we are and that we have a real faith. We, we have an authentic faith. Just as we mentioned, as we looked in Titus in, in chapter 2 in recent weeks, the life that we live should adorn the gospel. It should be like a, a wrapping to the gospel that makes it, that adorns it, that beautifies it, that, that makes the gospel look good, that makes being a Christian look good, that makes other people want to know more about being a Christian, want to know more about following Jesus Christ or having Jesus Christ in our lives. 
So us maintaining good works and us doing good works and us living our lives in a certain way, it ought to characterize us. It ought to be our testimony. It ought to be the life we live so that people see that our faith is real and that we're followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. Again, we understand that we're not saved by works. Titus chapter 3 there in verse 5 said, Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy He saved us. Do I get to heaven by keeping a list of good works and doing a list of good works? No. You can never earn your way to heaven by your works. Our only hope for heaven is to fall at the foot of the cross, to humble ourselves, admitting to God, I'm lost, I'm a sinner, I'm sinful. I need the Savior. I need Jesus Christ. And when you are willing to believe that Jesus is God, Jesus died for your sins, He took your place, He took your punishment, and he, he paid the, the penalty for your sins. And you'll simply turn to Him and trust Him. You can be forgiven. You can become a child of God. You can have a home in heaven and eternal life. So we understand we're not saved by our works. But a saved person should maintain good works. A saved person should maintain good works. Five times Paul said to Titus, you remind the people about good works. You remind the people to do do good works. You remind the people to maintain good works. Why? Because it ought to characterize them. Because they're a Christian now. They're a follower of Jesus Christ now. Our lives are to be different now that we know the Lord Jesus Christ. If you go back just a few pages to the left to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2 verses 8 through 10. It tells us something very similar as Titus told us. In Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 10, it says, Therefore, by grace are ye saved through faith. It's unmerited favor, it's undeserved. It's by God's grace that we can be saved when we put our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. It says, For by grace are ye saved through faith, verse 8, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, verse 9, not of works, lest any man should boast. So we're not saved by works. If we were saved by our works, we could go around boasting. Look at all that I've done. Look at how many of these laws I keep. Because I'm such a good person, that's why I'm allowed into heaven. I'm better than my neighbors. I'm better. None of that matters. We are all sinners. In desperate need of mercy and grace from the God of heaven. And only by mercy and grace can we be saved. It's not of our works. Do you understand what I'm saying? Do you understand that? We are not saved by our works. We are saved by the grace and mercy of God. But look what Ephesians 2 and verse 10 says. It just tells us we're not saved by works. We're, we're saved by grace, the grace of God. And then he says in verse 10, for we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. We're God's workmanship. When you and I got saved, it's because we put our faith in the gospel. We believe in Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit of God. He makes us a new creature. He makes us a new person. The Bible says in Titus that we're, we're regenerated by the Holy Spirit of God. So we're a new person. So we're all His workmanship. Right? If I'm saved, it's because I'm His workmanship, because He does a work in me, and by Him I'm born again, I'm quickened, I'm made alive, I have salvation, and I'm made a new person in Christ Jesus. But He says, for we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works. So now that He has saved me and I'm His workmanship, there's no doubt about it. That he has good works for us to do. He said there in Ephesians 2.10. We're created in Christ Jesus unto good works. Which God hath before ordained. He's, he's planned it. That we should walk in them. There are good works that we should be doing. There, there's, there are things that now should characterize our walk as a Christian. Our life as a Christian. Our behavior as a Christian. It's, it's going to change over time. 
because He's made us to do good works now that we're in Christ Jesus. As we allow Him to keep changing our, our heart and our mind and so on. See, God was working in our spirit is going to affect working in our soul and our heart and our mind and our thinking. It's going to affect then how we live and our actions, the things that we do. Our works. And so he wants to bring about a change in us that causes us to do good works, that we should walk in them, that we should maintain good works. There ought to be things that characterize our life now as a Christian that lets everybody know they're a follower of Jesus Christ. It shouldn't be that you would, you would work with someone for five years or really even five months and them not somehow learn, them not somehow learn that you are a Christian, right? Be because he's going to be start to be changing our behavior. He, there's going to be some good works that we're going to begin to walk in and walk in a new way. Not the same man. I, I don't walk the old road. I, I walk a new road, right? And so, there are good works, certainly, that the Lord has for us to do. The life that we live should show that we are no longer the same man that we used to be, but that He has changed us. Back there in Titus chapter 3, Titus chapter 3, notice verse 1 where He said, Be ready to every good work. Verse 2, Speak evil of no man. We're not to speak evil of others like maybe we would have used to. Why? Because we're a Christian now. We're not to be brawlers and fighters. We're, we're to be gentle. We're, 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 to, we're to show meekness to others. You know, one of the things that could be a great testimony to your co-worker or your neighbor was that before you got saved... You would just get into a royal fight with them about things. You would get into some royal arguments with them about things. But now that you're a Christian, you don't do that anymore. Because God's beginning to work in you. The fruit of the Holy Spirit's beginning to be produced in you. Are you perfect? No. But you're not a brawler like you used to be. You're not the fighter like you used to be. You're not going to be fighting for your rights and arguing about everything like you used to be. No, you'll be more willing to be submissive or meek or gentle or in honor prefer somebody else or let them get their way. I'm, I'm not going to fight over something that really doesn't matter. Why? Because you're different now. You're a Christian. Your, your actions are different than they used to be. You know, it, it ought to be that your husband, your wife, if, if they're not saved... They see that you're different than you used to be. Some of the things that used to control you no longer control you. Some of the ways you used to act, you don't act that way any longer. Why? Because he's changing your behavior. He's changing you. He's causing you to do good works. He's, he's making you a, a new man or, or a new wife for that matter. Right? First Peter 3 actually speaks to where there's wives who are Christians and their husbands not saved. It could be though that there's husbands that are saved and their wives not saved. It, it could be either way. But listen, when it comes to relatives, when it comes to neighbors, when it comes to co-workers, our lives ought to be being changed so that it becomes a testimony to them that we're a new creature. That we have Christ in us. We're just not the same person that we used to be. Notice verse 3. We ourselves also were sometimes foolish. He's being honest, right? Sometimes we did foolish things. Uh, sometimes we were disobedient. Sometimes we were deceived. Sometimes we just served our own lusts and pleasures. Sometimes we lived in malice and envy. Sometimes we were hateful. Sometimes we, we hated people. We were full of hatred and unkindness towards other people. But we're to be different. Why? Verse 4. After that, the kindness and love of God our Savior toward man appeared. Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy He saved us. By the washing of regeneration, He's regened us. When you were born, you were just born with the genes of your parents. Those genes would clearly identify you, that, that, you that, that that's who your mom and dad is, right? If we were to test all that out. You belong to that family. But we get some new spiritual genes, if you will, when we get saved. 
We're in Christ. We're regenerated. We're born again by the Holy Spirit of God, renewed by the Holy Ghost, the Bible says. Verse 7, look at Titus 3, 7, that being justified by His grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. And then verse 8, this is a faithful saying, and these things I will, that thou affirm constantly. Constantly, continually affirm it. Remind them of this. Teach them this. That they which have believed in God, they're now Christians. They're now born again. They're now followers of Jesus Christ. Affirm constantly what? That they might be careful to maintain good works. Be careful about how you're living. Live a new way. Let, let Christ change you. You should now walk in good works. Maintain good works. Do good works. Because Christ within you, the Spirit of God within you, is trying to change you. So that this new person that you are, as a born-again Christian, it begins to change your, your heart, your desires, it changes your mind. It changes your way of thinking about things. The way you used to think, you no longer think the same way. Some of the things you used to love, you no longer love those same things. Some of those things you used to hate, now you love those things. Why is that? It's because God is working in you. His Spirit is in your spirit. And He begins to renew your heart and mind and change you. And, and it's a work on the inside, but it's going to show up out here. It's going to begin to show up in how you talk to your wife, in how you talk to your husband. You know, some of the addictions that you used to have before you got saved, the Lord wants to help you have victory to drop those addictions and maybe start getting some new addictions over here. <laughs> right? Where now you're feeling, man, you're, you're, you're so addicted to, to that church. You go to church every Sunday. You're so addicted. Man, I see you sometimes, and you're opening up your Bible. You, you, right? Things are to change. And we're to maintain a life of good works and allow our lives and behavior to be changed. Because that will be a good testimony to others. Those things cannot save us. He's clear about that. But he says at the end of verse 8 that these things are good and profitable unto men. For you to be careful to maintain good works and allow your behavior to change and do good works and so on, it says it's good and profitable unto men. What does all that mean? I'm not sure. It's, it's good and profitable for you. I know that. It'll be good and profitable for you one day up in heaven, but maybe it's even good and profitable for other people around you too who see that you're no longer the same person that you used to be. Because He's changing you. And so we ought to be mindful that good works is important in our life. Good works ought to characterize our life because we're a new creature. We're, we're a new person in the Lord Jesus Christ. There, there's no way we can argue with that. We're His workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works. In all things showing thyself a pattern of good works works. A peculiar people zealous of good works, ready to every good work, careful to maintain good works. Let us also learn to m maintain good works. That's what God teaches us. We ourselves also were. There's something we used to be. But after that, he, he saved us. That being justified by His grace, that they which have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works. And so it speaks very clearly to, to what we were before we knew Christ. What we were before we were born again. We did put our faith in the gospel. We did believe Jesus Christ and the Spirit of God came to live in us. It speaks to what we were and what we used to be. But he's telling us we're to be different. And we're to maintain good works. It speaks clearly to what we were and what we are to be now. It speaks to what we've done in the past and what Christ has done for us and what we are supposed to be and be becoming. Be becoming in the rest of our life. Just down in chapter number 9 just mention this as we 
see something here, but he says, avoid foolish questions and genealogies and contentions, striving about the law, for they are unprofitable and vain. This seems to go into another topic, really, and, and it does in a sense, right? But he's addressing Paul speaking to Titus, tells him that you've got to avoid some foolish questions and just kind of wasting your time, really, in contentious arguments about things that are unprofitable and vain and meaningless. You know, there's always going to be people that are going to get off and maybe fall for some false doctrine or come up with some false belief or have some different opinion about this, that, or the other thing. But he warns about that. He warns about that. And he says there in verse 10, a, a man that is an heretic, they're just a heretic with some things maybe they're, they're just all dogmatic about and things they're trying to preach or teach or put forward or influence people with something that's it's heretical. It's false. It's wrong. He says, you know, don't waste your time striving with them. He says, you admonish them. You admonish them the first time and see if they'll change. You admonish them a second time and see if they'll change. But he says, if they won't change after a first admonition and a second admonition, then he says, you just have to come to them a third time. And if they're just going to keep trying to s spread or influence others with some heretical false doctrine or false beliefs or things they're all set on, and he says, they, they, they just need to be put out of the church. I, I would wish that there'd never have to be anything like that, but that's how the Bible teaches to handle it. And we need to, need to understand that. He says, knowing that he that is such is subverteth, subverted and sinneth, being condemned of himself. And so that's some teaching and how something like that should be handled regarding heretics or false teachers, those that would really just cause strife or contention or division. They were to be confronted and rebuked and admonished two times. And if they would still not change, then they, God's Word teaches that they were to be rejected. They're to be rejected. They're to be put out so that the church can have harmony and go forward and be blessed of God. But the lesson I really want you to most importantly take home today is this lesson of us maintaining good works. It ought to characterize you because you're a new creature. If you've been born again, if you've been saved, if you've accepted the Lord Jesus into your life, you're a new person. You're a new creature. You are in Christ Jesus. You've been justified. You're set free from the penalty of sin, from the punishment from sin, that you're no longer going to face that. For Romans 8, 1 says you're no longer condemned if you're in Christ Jesus. But understand that now that you're in Christ, some new things should characterize your life. You're not the same person that you used to be. And so it shouldn't be works of the flesh that characterize you. It should begin to be that there's some works of the Holy Spirit and fruit of the Holy Spirit that characterize your life. Because we're His workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works. Right? And Titus 2 and verse number, where was it? Titus 2, 7 said, And all things show in thyself a pattern of good works. Titus 2 and verse 14 said, He wants to purify in himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. Romans 3, 1, uh, Be ready to every good work. Uh, Romans, uh, sorry, not Romans, sorry, Titus rather. Titus 3 and verse 8, Affirm constantly that they which have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable unto them. And then Titus 3 and verse 14, let ours also learn to maintain good works for necessary uses that they be not unfruitful. 
God wants us to be being changed, becoming fruitful Christians, growing Christians, maturing in the Lord. And so there ought to be good works that begin to characterize your life as you allow the Lord to change you. And that should be your desire. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I ask you to help us to realize the importance of good works characterizing our life after we become Christians. Us allowing the Spirit of God to continue His work in us. In Genesis 28, Jacob has a dream. He sees a ladder reaching to heaven. The Lord stands above and speaks to Jacob, saying, I am the Lord God of Abraham thy father and the God of Isaac. God promises to bless Jacob and to be with him and to never leave Jacob until he has fulfilled all that he has planned for Jacob's life. When Jacob awakes, he senses the presence of God was with him in that place. And he calls that place Bethel, Bethel meaning the house of God. Jacob vows that the Lord God of his father and grandfather will be his God also. He vows to follow the Lord. Jacob ends up spending the next many years of his life being deceived and then deceiving his uncle Laban. In, Jacob 30, in, in chapter 31, Jacob has another dream. The Lord speaks to Jacob in his dream and says, I am the God of Bethel, where you made your vow unto me. Arise, Jacob, and return to the land of your fathers. In chapters 32 and 33, Jacob seeks grace and kneels to restore his broken relationship with his brother Esau. In the midst of that, Jacob wrestles with God one night. Jacob has an experience with God that is life transforming. In his wrestling with the Lord that night, Jacob cries out, I will not let thee go, except thou bless me. The Lord responds to his desire that night and says, Thy name shall no more be called Jacob, but Israel. For as a prince hast thou power with God and with men, and hast prevailed. God tells Jacob, You will no longer be a deceiver. You will be a prince, and you will have power and influence with God and men. In chapter 35, after Jacob perhaps reaping some of the sad consequences because of some of the earlier sins in his life when he was a deceiver, the Lord God tells Jacob to return to that place called Bethel, that significant place where earlier in his life he had known the presence of God and vowed to follow God and live for God. There, upon returning to Bethel, Jacob leads his family and others in a time of purifying their lives, ridding themselves of false gods, and consecrating their lives to follow the Lord God. They build an altar there at Bethel, and Jacob rededicates himself to serve God. In a wonderful and powerful way, he commits himself to the God of Bethel. And Jacob now calls that place El Bethel, meaning the God of the house of God. There at Bethel, God appears to Jacob and talks to him and blesses him. Jacob's life becomes one of great fruitfulness as he follows the Lord and experiences his blessing in life. If you and I need a personal revival, a fresh awareness of the presence of God, let us go back to Bethel. Let us return to the loving arms of the Lord Jesus Christ, who wants to embrace us and love us and use us and bless us. Let us get back to the place of prayer, the Word of God, the house of God, and once again live in God's presence and do those things which can bring great blessing. Sublime, back to protection the world cannot.